and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is your Reverend, Faith and Current Affairs. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Irreverent Faith and Current Affairs. I'm Jamie Franklin, and I'm joined this week, I'm delighted to be joined this week by Daniel French. Daniel, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing well, actually. It's regatta week here in Salkham, so the town is buzzing. Wow. Uh, on Sunday night, I had some irreverent fans here on holiday who Excellent. joined us for our outdoor service, which was fab. And then in the morning, actually, I had a uh, irreverent fan and his family, a priest uh, from uh, the, the Diocese of Coventry. Oh, uh, nice. So shout out to James. James just took me out for coffee this morning. Yeah. Uh, Anna is in the uh, second year of his curacy. Yeah. And the week before, as some people may know, I, I had an irreverent fan turn up at church. Didn't realise it was my church. Didn't realise who I was till at the end of the service. Uh, and uh, we and um, some members of his family went out for uh, coffee and it ended up that He'd had a conversion experience, as has his mother in the last few years, migrated out of hard atheism, having felt um, the uh, the challenges of society and the, mm. you know, the emerging darkness and all of that and feeling mm. I've got to, I've, it's all true and I've got to grasp the Christ. So I said, well, I think the best thing you need to do then is get baptised. So yeah. My wife and I baptised him in the sea and wow. gave him Holy Communion. That's fantastic, Daniel. That's fantastic and uh, uh, yeah, he's uh, just raving about it. Actually, he's really, really, um, you know, twenty nine years old, street performer and website designer. So shout out to Ben, Ben Fairhead, yes. and his mother Kate. Ben, great. Well, we hope you're doing well, Ben. That's awesome news. Really, really pleased. So, to yeah, I'm, I'm on a wave of. Um... Well, you've also got some kind of crazy yeah. dog in the background Good there, on. Daniel. With some kind of yeah. mad, mad dog. Uh, he's just seen a heretic, probably. What's his name? Uh, Rory. Rory the dog. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, hey, listen, Daniel, um, we have got a great ep- uh, great interview with the Reverend Richard Fothergill coming up in the second half of this episode. So wait, wait, wait around, not wait around, continuing, continue listening is what I should say for that. That's coming up in the second half. We've already done the interview. And let me tell you, Richard Fothergill is an absolutely based vicar. He's, mm. he's based I didn't expect at, that. Did, did you? Well, I expected something good, but you know, <laughs> it, pretty, was really it was pretty good. impressive. It was pretty yeah. impressive. So you've got to stick around for that because we talked about loads of stuff. We talked about his thing called the filling station, which is a, it really seems like a real move of God again uh, across the whole of the country and, and, and internationally. Satanic deception in Britain, materialism, ego-driven society, sexual deviation, his involvement in deliverance from uh, the occult, uh, not personally, but, you know, in, in terms of his ministry um, uh, in the in the filling station and the fact that he was debanked by the uh, Yorkshire Building Society for his, for his shocking opinions, Daniel, uh, shocking opinions in, in response to one of their um, customer satisfaction surveys. It's, it's a really haunting story, isn't it? And it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's one that should um, should give us pause for concern pause for thought and concern really yeah and, you know yeah. if they can um, if they can do this to a vicar yeah they can do it to anyone man pause pause for thought cause for concern i think that's mm. i think there are two there are two sayings there which are quite quite similar aren't they uh daniel before we do anything just a couple of notices just to say to everyone that there will be an irreverent meetup at the march for life on saturday september the 7th in london in westminster so if you Is like that the 7th or the 2nd the 2nd that's saturday september the 2nd oh, i can't be there i've got a wedding and it's my 55th birthday Oh, my goodness. Well, those are two very important reasons not to be there, Daniel. But I will be there representing a reverend and there will be a meetup as well. So that's on Saturday, September the 2nd. So if you want to come to that, just mark it in your diary and there'll be more details of that coming up. That's an all day event. Um, if you like this podcast, uh, please do subscribe to it on YouTube, on your podcatcher, share it with your friends, rate and review it. Now, I asked last week for some reviews on iTunes and I have got at least three. So I'm going to read some of them out um now bear in mind that i fished for these reviews but nevertheless we got them restore restores my faith in the church the irreverent podcast is something that i look forward to each week and find it hard to live without oh my goodness it sounds like you're it sounds like you're making an idol of the podcast and honest, i think that's too much but nevertheless i'll just take it as a compliment the issues of our day such are tackled head on 
And it is extremely encouraging to hear the three reverends, Jamie, Tom and Daniel, discuss these from a Christian perspective. It is an antidote to the woke church. Thank you very much, CD Tab Man One. Uh, Joe G. Rob says, I look forward to this podcast every week. Ja- ja- Jamie, Dan, Tom and Daniel will provide insightful, entertaining and rude and at times charmingly meandering takes on current affairs, the church and Bible studies. I can also recommend subscribing to them to get an extra podcast on college. You can do that, by the way, if you go to our website, reverendpod.com, and become a patron for as little as pound fifty plus VAT in the UK per month. And another one, great podcast from Alexios, Man of God. I think I know who this is. Uh, this is probably my favorite podcast, and the only one I'm a patron of. I can't recommend it highly enough. The Revs got me through some very tough times during the lockdowns when I felt my church had abandoned me. It's always interesting, and I enjoy the good natured sparring between Father Jamie and Tom. I've met Father Jamie and know him to be a good and true Christian. God bless all the irreverent re- revs, Alexios. Well, there we go. And if you'd like to leave a, a rating and a review on uh, iTunes, it does really help us because it pushes up the algorithm. And I will read them out as well, as I've just proved. So um, please do do that. So that's a way you can really help us. But no money. Just leave a review or share this podcast. Share it with a friend. Think right now, I'm going to share this podcast with one person. And if all of our viewers and listeners share the podcast with one person, then I'm sure that will have a a good effect on our overall audience. We'll be able to reach more people. But before anything else, Daniel, I think it's time for us to do a bit of scriptural reading because we like to anchor our Mm. conversations in the word of God, even if they are meandering. And it's surprising how many people describe this podcast as meandering, but I like to think of it as charmingly and interestingly meandering. I don't know what you think about that, Daniel. Meandering, but never winsome. I would have thought always winsome. Meandering, but never boring. I think that's what you mean. Exactly. <laughs> All right, we're going to do. We're going to read Psalm two today because as we're as we're recording, it's the first day of the month, and in the Book of Common Prayer, you go through the Psalms. Um, you you read the psalms um, sequentially based on the day of the month. So when it gets the fourth day, uh, first day of the month, I should say, you 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 go you go back to the beginning and you start to read them all again. You read one, you read the whole thing in a month, basically. Don't know what I'm trying to say. Um, I'm saying, Daniel, I don't... Do you know, I was reading this as thinking uh, our our introduction starts with Carbon Mike, doesn't it? Doing the um, voiceover. Yeah. Wouldn't it be lovely to have Carbon Mike read Psalm two? Uh, it it not, would be not, against, not, not anything against you or I doing it, but uh, um, it would be it would be an incredible thing to hear to hear his dulcet tones, wouldn't it? Um, reading out Psalm two, that would be really cool. Particularly since it's a really punchy one, and he's got that he's got that kind of edgy. New, is he New York? He he does live yeah. in New York. Yeah, so New York. Yeah. He's got that kind of yeah. gravity. He d- he's a programmer. He lives in New York. Mm. He's a computer programmer, software programmer. And he lives in New York. Uh, I, Ro- I kind of imagine Morpheus in my head. You know, he sound he does sound a bit like Lawrence Fishburne, doesn't he? Yeah, he's he's too cool. Yeah, that's that's just the way of it. Anyway, let's read the show. We should do a we should do prayer first. Why don't um why don't I do the Lord's prayer, Daniel? You can read the scripture. Should we do it that way? Okay, okay. okay. Let's just pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Psalm 2. Why do the heathens so furiously rage together? Why do the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth stand up and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed. Let us break their bonds asunder, cast their cords from us. He that dwelleth in heaven shall laugh them to scorn. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will preach the law whereof the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. Desire of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the utmost parts of the earth for thy possession. Shall, thou shalt bruise them with a rod of iron and break them in the pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. 
be learned, ye that are judges of the earth. Serve the Lord in fear and rejoice with him with reverence. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and so ye perish from the right away. If his wrath be kindled, yea, but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Wow. That's such a such a powerful translation, isn't it? It's of course the Miles Coverdale translation from the, the Book of Common Tre- Common Prayer that really brings across the drama of the psalm. I love the the phrase, what is it, vex them in his sore displeasure. That's a wonderful, that's a wonderful phrase. I mean, I guess I guess the reason I don't know, Daniel, you and I both said that we sort of independently thought of this psalm today, didn't we? I mean, the reason I was thinking about this is because I mean, I read it this morning, but I was also preparing. Uh, my sermon for this coming Sunday, and it's the it's the uh, feast of the Transfiguration on Sunday, August the sixth, and uh, we have a reading from Daniel chapter seven, and the reading from Daniel chapter seven is the image of the Ancient of Days, uh, who represents God the Father, and then the the Son of Man, to whom is given this dominion by the Ancient of Days. You know, glory, power, honor. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is one that will not pass away. And this is this is um, contrasted with the earlier part of the chapter where you have these beasts that are fighting against each other, you know, representing the empires of the world who who commit violence and wage wars against one another and displace one another within the vicissitudes of, of history. And then that's contrasted with this this son of man who is given this everlasting dominion. And I was saying about the transfiguration, that the transfiguration is a sort of moment of, in, of unveiling where the disciples see something of the glory of Christ. Um, but that that glory in, in Christ's incarnation is always sort of hidden and then revealed and hidden and then revealed again. I think that's actually one of the things that's really good about the TV show, The, the Chosen, actually, is that they get that sort of um, that ambivalence about Christ really, really nicely between mm. the sort of the fact that he is... Um, as the Wesley hymn puts it, veiled in flesh, but then, but then for I for those with eyes to see, they can see something of His glory. Anyway, the point is, is that the glory of the Son is um, spoken of a number of times in the Old Testament or in the Hebrew Scriptures. There's this figure, you know, kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. You know, this is speaking of Christ. It's looking forward to the Messiah, the one who will ultimately receive the glory and the dominion. And as I say, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom that will never pass away. And it's just a, I just think it's a salutary thing to remember when we look at this world and the world is so self-confident, it's so self-assured. It says, you know, this is the way things are. This is the way they will be forever. This is the right way, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, we're subjects of another kingdom. We're subjects of a kingdom which really will not pass away, which really is eternal, which really has got at the right values and it's at odds with this kingdom and you know we have to be we have to be okay with that we have to learn to live with that so that's, I, I thought that's, ex- that's my take. Uh, just another dimension to it is the is the tone of it which you know in comparison i'm sure we're going to hear this with reverend richard in a minute how often the church has failed to in the contemporary world to uh, to point to that which is behind the veil in Christ, mm. uh, and presented a, a sort of um, kind of wet Jesus, mm. you know, um, an, an undemanding Christ, uh, uh, and uh, and here I think we, you know, we we have something that speaks to um, I, I think that that constituency of people at the moment who are troubled with the ways of the world and its direction mm. uh, who do feel that there's a, uh, or, or beginning to open up to a perception that there is a, that there is a spiritual battle here with Richard and later on, we're going to hear from Ephesians six, his thoughts on mm. that. Uh, and that there is, there is spiritual warfare and, and battle. Uh, and we experience the fury of the heathen. Mm. Uh, it, it's 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 part of the the pushback that we're getting the furious pushback on on the gospel uh, that the uh, uh, that many would like the old gods to return mm, uh, uh, and and to disenfranchise our, our society of its Christian heritage 
and I, and I think many are rightly feeling a reaction to that and and, and I ha- I'm wanting to do something about that and feel a, a, a righteous anger uh, and and the psalm is speaking to that sense of you know we as Israel we may be a tiny little nation but you know uh, that the lion of Judah has teeth mm, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, you know that line in the line, the line in the in the line and the witch in the wardrobe, isn't it? Where the the beavers describe Aslan to the Pevensey children, and uh, one of the girls says, "Oh, I shouldn't like to meet a, a lion." Sounds scary, you know. Um, and the, the beavers' response is 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 wonderful, isn't it? About that, uh, well, they say, "Is he safe?" Don't they? Yes, he's not. No, he's not safe, but he is good. Yeah, he's not yeah. safe, and and I think this this is often what we. I think there's so many people who are wanting to hear about the unsafe God, mm. uh, and uh, and we're presenting instead the safe God, mm. um, or the God of health and safety, mm. the, the God of worldly conformities <laughs> are coming forward rather than the the real God of, of the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you think as well, I mean, just a sort of common sense thought, if there really is a God, it's unlikely that he would conform himself exactly to our values. It's probably more likely that, you know, um, he would have something to say to us rather than oh, well done. You've got everything absolutely right. You know, when you consider how different, human societies are how different civilizations are um you know why do we assume that this is the right way this is the only way um it's likely that ours isn't the right the right yardstick but actually there's there's something else that comes in from outside to judge us and speaking of that daniel we should probably go to our first story shouldn't we because uh, you picked this one up didn't you about um costa coffee facing a boycott over their apparently irresponsible advert of a trans man so uh what's going on here daniel why did this catch you up um it's, it's in the telegraph today and it's been around social media uh so by the time the show goes out this will be out for a couple of days that there is a costa mobile van if i've got this right uh that uh, has a uh, below the logo there is a cartoon of a uh, uh, a person whose breasts have been removed. Mm. So you see in cartoon style, um, it's in that kind of Ice Age, Stone Age kind of cartoony graphic. Uh, you've got this figure um, where the, the breasts are, there are scars, and um, there's a logo celebrating whatever, you know. Yeah. Uh, and... Um, uh, it's extraordinary, you know, to actually show a cartoon of someone with opera with a, a female with their breasts removed and say, Well, this is fantastic, you know, this is inclusive. It, it's, um, yeah, it's it's quite something. It's, it's yeah, I, I mean, I, I can't believe. I mean, there's a number of people who are saying on, on Twitter, Is this real? Is this fake? But I think if the if the newspapers are picking it up and Costa haven't denied it now, I mean, it's it's uh now 20 past four and there's no there's been no denial no no rebuttal of the story we can only but imagine that it is the case and it's not a bit of clever photoshopping yeah um, i mean they, they don't deny it and they've got a spokesman on the i mean it's shockingly daniel shockingly it says a costa coffee spokesman which i think is very very um patriarchal so Bad, bad telegraph. A Costa Coffee spokesman said, at Costa Coffee, we celebrate the diversity of our customers, team and partners. We want everyone that interacts with us uh, to experience. Sorry, I was a bit just taken aback by the bad grammar there. It should be we want everyone who interacts with us, but never mind. Uh, just, it just really annoys me, that kind of thing. To experience the inclusive environment that we create, to encourage people to feel welcomed, free and unashamedly proud to be themselves. The mural, so they're omitting that it comes from there, the mural in its entirety showcases and celebrates inclusivity. So they so they're they're basically accepting that this comes from them. Mm. 
I mean, the thing I, that I don't know how the cost of management structure works. Um, so maybe someone can tell us. For, maybe listeners might know that you know. Is it the case that you buy the franchise um, and uh, you operate it for them, or is it uh, you know, a direct a, 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 a direct building of a cost of coffee? Because I, I feel sorry if it's a franchise. If someone's just so, oh, I put a Costa thing in my. No, I don't. I, I, Cafe I, or whatever that they're 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 going to feel. You know, a lot of people who are running these places are probably going to feel really peed off. I mean, that's a good question, Daniel. Before we call for a for a nationwide boycott, we should probably work out what the answer to that one is. But I imagine that it is a central thing. Um, the The reason I say that is because I know that um, what's the blue one? Cafe Nero. I know mm. that that is very kind of centrally controlled in terms of the. Um, you know, the uh, music that's played in each of the cafes. And I think even like the smell and stuff like that, they have a sort of particular smell that they try and pipe yeah. in uh, in order to create a certain type of at- atmosphere. In fact, Laura Dosworth and um, Patrick Fagan talk about that in their new book, um, Free Your Mind. Lots, lots of places do that. They have they have smells which they pump into places in order to create the right kind of uh, sort of selling environment. And I'm pretty sure that they do that in coffee shops as well. But nevertheless, it is a good it is a good point to make. Um, one of the other things about this, and it relates to our conversation that listeners will hear later about uh, Richard Fotherkill and the the um, Yorkshire Building Society, is a lot of people are looking at this kind of thing and they're thinking, what's this got to do with coffee? Why do we have to have an image of a a woman who's had a double mastectomy on a coffee van? Why? Why are these? Why are these you know, banks and and coffee shops and building societies? Why are they obsessed with pushing this woke agenda? Why aren't they more concerned with actually selling the products that they are meant to sell? And you could say the same thing about the church as well, couldn't you? Why is the church not interested in Christianity, mm-hmm. but is more interested in in uh, you know promoting the woke progressive agenda? It does seem really strange, doesn't it? No, and, and you know, if this was a cartoon about someone who's on the back of cancer, a, a lady who's had a double mastectomy, and the whole chain wants to say, you know, people who are undergoing this terrible treatment, uh, you know, we we support you, you know, have a free coffee on us mm. after you've had this, you know, as a perk, yeah. blah 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 blah. That that's a different narrative, isn't it? Completely different. <laughs> to you know, uh, here's a is it trans man trans. I yes. don't know. I always forget this. I think I it's, I think it's, a, trans, myself, I think it's yeah. a trans man, isn't it? It's a trans man. Yeah. A woman, I mean, how, how on earth are they going to celebrate a trans yeah. woman? I, yeah. I don't want, I don't particularly want to think of this. Yeah, it is, it is because that's, that's what they're always saying. Trans women are women, isn't yeah. it? Because they're saying that men are women. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Karen. Mm. Sorry. Had you finished? Or? Uh, yeah. That's, yeah. That's yeah. my point. Yeah. No, no, no. I think it's a good point. I think it's a good point. So it's, it's, um, it's really weird. And it, it it's this kind of woke capitalism thing, isn't it? Whereby it seems like no matter what the corporation or organization is, they are more interested in pushing the woke progressive agenda more than they are doing whatever it is that they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Imagine. Focus on the coffee, Costa. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But I mean I, I suspect if I were to take a guess, that there's that um the quality the quality of the product is inversely proportional to the um, woke advertising. Yeah, that could be true. It could be true. You know, um, I'm just trying to think. I, I have to say, I don't actually like Costa Coffee very much. I find it um, pretty bitter, and uh, I prefer um, probably prefer Nero of the chain shops. But I don't mm. really like any of them. Too I, I, I'd agree. I'm new to coffee. I've only been started really? drinking it in the last couple of years really so um and only in the last sort of six months probably most days having one yeah. so uh, i'm a bit of a newbie to it all night i think i would say yes that uh cost is okay ish but yeah i mean other I, chains worked... are better though I, i've not gone to i've tried to avoid starbucks and yeah, starbucks I think is they're, they're, they're even more um yeah. ideological and they're very it's very in your face really and i just think yeah. you know i want i want to break from this really yeah it's, and it's good to support uh, local it's good to support local companies and people because you know i, I remember as a university chaplain that um the student union really struggled to you know they put on really cheap meals and coffee and tea and what have you uh 
yeah, the co- everybody goes. Everybody goes to the Costa and the McDonald's and the Starbucks because it's the trendy place to go. When mm. you can get actually something better from a local provider <laughs> at a cheaper yeah. price, you know. But yeah. branding, branding has a great power over us. Of course it does. Of course it does. I think I think Starbucks is pretty filthy coffee, to be honest with you. And I really object to the way that they ask you your name when you order a coffee in there, your first name, and then they then they call you by your first name. To me, this is this is just um Oh, you but you know what you've got to do? You've got to say yeah. father. <laughs> Try that well, one. Maybe I just I just I just object to it. I want I just want to buy a coffee. I don't want to be cross-examined. I don't want to tell people what my name is. Thank you very much. Another thing to say about this place, I've worked in a couple of coffee shops before, and uh, I know that basically the, the quality of the coffee you get varies anyway, depending on when the 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 bean the beans have been roasted and they just roast the beans and then store them. And so they could be they could be uh, more freshly roasted. They could be older. Depends how long they've been stored for, and it depends how mu- much they have in stock. So it's actually very variable. So anyone anyone who says there's a kind of you know a standard level of coffee quality in these shops is is mistaken. Uh, or they're just or it's just part of the psyop, Daniel. It's it's just all propaganda. Um, anyway, um, there we go. Uh, the uh, moving on to the next story uh, here. Now I I highlighted this. This is about inheritance tax, and I was just I was just reading a bit about this um, this week, um, and I just I find it um, absolutely shocking um, what's going on in this country. Um, so just a couple of things about inheritance tax in this country. So inheritance tax raises about £7 billion in this country, which is less than 1% of government uh, revenues. Now, if you compare our situation with the US, the tax in the US, so inheritance tax is when your your you know your mother or your father or whoever wants to give you money dies, okay? So in the US, US uh, inheritance tax doesn't kick in until an estate is valued at more than £12.92 million, which is £10 million. So you get taxed on that if you're that wealthy, if your parents or whomever are that wealthy, you get taxed on that. In the UK, it's it can be imposed from as low as £500,000. And that thresh- threshold is scheduled to be frozen for years, which is looking like that, that could actually come down. I think the figure was something like £350,000. And when you're taxed on it, you're taxed 40%, which I just think is is an obscene well i mean i don't even i don't even see what the legitimacy is in stealing people's wealth when their when their parents die anyway it just seems to me to be an absolute uh, absolutely obscene act of of theft uh, when when yeah. when it, it hardly it hardly raises any rev- revenue anyway and you don't even need it uh, the, it's the, a false the, economy the, isn't it as well because uh you know for, for, for a town like here in Salkham, where the property prices are really high, are valued at really high, uh, in, in probate, what you can end up with is that, you know, uh, granny dies and wants to wants to pass on mm. her house to a lo- to her children who live yeah. locally, and it ends up that it's unaffordable for them to to do so because they've got to sell it to clear that. 40% debt yeah. uh, because the, the property that she may have bought for 20 grand is now worth yeah. whatever. Uh, and um, it, it means that they end up moving out the village. Yeah. Uh, and so we end up with this, this town where a large proportion of the houses are, are, are second homes only because inheritance tax. And I've noticed a few people who've had that happen have essentially the, the, the inheritance tax has meant that they've had to move from from here so that you know it, it kind of takes away the soul yeah. gradually it works away at the soul uh, of um you know rural seaside villages and and places like us you know who yeah. okay have done well in the property boom i suspect it's the same for whitstable herm bay yeah, yeah. southwold um and and so on um uh, and, and then you've also got the whole thing about yeah, money never. We, we seem to have a system where it's, it's now becoming increasingly difficult to pass on your property to your children because you know it's going to go into care home fees. It's going to go to to this. It's going to go to inheritance tax, uh, yeah. uh, and so everything is going pipelined through the 
the, the monster that becomes the state, isn't that rather yeah. than being locally held? Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the point I wanted to make about this, because, I mean, obviously, we're we're speaking about this from a from a, a Christian and scriptural point of view. So so why did I why did I bring this up apart from the fact that I find it annoying um, to think about this? And it is that is exactly that, Daniel. It's about the fact that the state just is growing and growing and growing and it's infiltrating more and more areas of life. And this is a direct attack on the independence of family life because it's meaning that people have to sell their houses have to sell their estates in order to pay money for to the government which the government is essentially stealing and this is the way this is the way the government essentially destroyed the aristocracy in this country and this is a war in the middle class because we're not talking about people who are incredibly rich we're talking about a situation where children a lot of children um of parents so you know children who grow up to be adults can't afford to buy houses because houses are too expensive and they don't have enough money even if they're solidly middle class people with mm. reasonable incomes they can't afford to buy houses and so the only hope they have for buying a house is if they inherit money but the government's now looking to take 40 percent away if you inherit three hundred and fifty thousand pounds so you still won't be able to buy a house because the government will steal your money or you'll have to sell your parents house so you can't even live in it now can i just make a point from a sort of theological perspective it remain it reminds me of a quotation i read out in our uh, live event from joe boots book um uh called rule of kings and i'd like to to read this i like this book i don't joe's coming from a very mm. very re continental reform perspective and i would have a different perspective on some of the things he says but this i completely agree with this quote i think i know the quote i remember yeah yeah it's a yeah. great quote i love i love this quote um, the explosion of the regulatory state in the last 70 years, and especially over the last 30, reaching into more and more areas of private life and civil society is rooted in the idea of the omnicompetence of the state and its bureaucracy. Neither scripture nor historical Christian thought well into the earlier 20th century ever envisaged such a freedom sapping behemoth overtaking life. Today, there is no end to the tens of thousands of state regulations to be obeyed in the Anglosphere in numerous departments of life. As I found out after a recent move, this is him moving from um, Canada to, to England, by the way, there are permits required for almost every kind of renovation activity on private property, including the size and colour of garden sheds or moving a bathroom sink, as well as detailed regulations covering the use of one's property. There are permits and regulations for working from a home office, as well as onerous worksite and office regulations. In fact, the regulations in Western nations are so diverse, they cover everything from the size and shape of bananas, the length of nails required in drywall, and who is allowed to feed pigs. More regulations require permits for collecting rags and metals, and others control games on private premises. Various bylaws mandate the number of parking spaces required per set, that must be seat, in church sanctuaries in Toronto, and liquor stores and are barred from selling refrigerated water or soda in Indiana. The list is literally endless and frequently absurd. This omnicompetent vision of the state has become so ubiquitous that many evangelical Christians have lost their cultural memory of God-given, pre-political institutions, rights and responsibilities that are mm. to be protected, but are not created, controlled or governed by the state. And the family and the family's right to have private wealth and property is one of those uh, well, they are pre-political institutions, i.e. the family, rights and responsibilities, right to own property, right to health, wealth, responsibility to one's children. And this is, uh, uh, as I say, a completely godless interference with family life. And in this particular instance, this is a war in the middle class. And so people should oppose this. Mm. And and what, what you have, end up with on the back of that is a whole professional cast who move away from being entrepreneurial to to joining this sort of bullshit job desk job yeah uh you know monster yeah. out there and um you know w whether it's the hmrc office which is a uh, huge tens of tens of thousands of people who are, are often just moving money mm. a few hundred pounds on each people's accounts from one week to the other uh, because they're on you know tax credits or whatever when you could just simply <laughs> get rid of the whole thing by just changing the tax bans, you know, and yeah, uh, yeah, we, we, uh, it, yeah. It, it's like people pay, it, pay tax, and then there's a whole government department for redistributing the tax to the people who have paid tax back yeah. to the people who have paid it. I, I, I had it down to the penny about ten years ago. I think I worked out that my tax bill I was getting back because we had two little children at the time, uh, and uh, my, my wife was not in employment. So we pay tax. I pay tax on the stipend, and then get it back two weeks later. 
Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's the same thing. It's the same wait, thing with wait, me. Stop, I'm working. Just, yeah, I get working. Just don't tax, tax me. Yeah. What's the just, point? Just don't tax me. Yeah. Why do you need? But there are thousands and thousands of people working in these departments doing this. You know, like like Gringold in Harry Potter's mm-hmm. bank do, do, doing these these rather pointless low yield jobs and and the great you know we have the american dream but i think the great british dream is is anyone should be able to start up a small shop with say 500 pounds mm. uh, and what you've got at the moment is it is incredibly difficult it's a huge mountain to to be able to open a shop mm. you know what Napoleon joked about the British as a nation of small shopkeepers, but actually that's our strength. You know, Margaret Thatcher was a grocer's daughter. Mm. Uh, and, and and yet, subsequently, if you look now, that a lot of the people who are in control and in government, on both sides of the, the political spectrum, uh, are, are not from those backgrounds anymore because those backgrounds have been, those industries have been pushed down. It's very, very hard to start a small business. Mm. Uh, that the regulation, the red tape, the the business tax, the uh, yeah. people, uh, even down here, it should be you should be able to set up uh, a stall to sell anything yeah. with, with almost no effort, and um, and yet it's it's a nightmare. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But do you not think, Daniel, that really underlying all of this is indicative of a kind of spiritual idolatry of the state? It's just the state grows and grows and grows. And it's almost like we've lost our vision to even see the fact that, you know, that, that we've 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 come to sort of rely on the state in a kind of godlike capacity almost. Well, it's 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 safety, isn't it? Safetyism, it's easy, it's mm. lazy, it's much easier to have a job where you go up the ranks of um, some some large corporate institution that is again just just pushing paper around and you know you're you're getting 50 60k maybe in the, the mid part of your career in that to act, you know beginning by putting a market stall out mm. uh, and uh, you know selling or making stuff or planting <laughs> planting vegetables and selling them uh, and actually keeping the profit rather than giving away most of it and giving most of your i think what people don't understand is the time mm. that uh, it, you know it's exhausting the people i speak to in these small businesses they begrudge the money but they really struggle with the amount of time that mm. they have to do and that takes away family time that you know that means that uh, it's really difficult if you get sick. Um, it's yeah. it's got so many challenges. Yet this should be the British dream. Yeah, it it also empties people out spiritually as well. Mm. It's interesting you used that phrase "bullshit jobs" earlier, and I don't know whether you're referring to this, but there's actually a book by a sociologist called David Gray, yeah. which is called "Bullshit Jobs," and it's really worth it's really worth listening. It um, reading, sorry, it's a, it's a very good book. But essentially, Graeber says that about half of social work is um sorry societal work is is pointless um and he describes i just i just i'm not doing this from memory to be to be fair i just googled it because I, I i wanted to find this he describes five types of entirely pointless jobs so he talks about flunkies goons duct tapers box tickers and task mark mask masters sorry but the point of all of this is that this is just you know people people who he surveyed and who he interviewed recognize that their jobs are absolutely pointless and that they are just, you know, they're just, I remember one example, he talks about that this guy's job was to, um, you know, um, to do these, these surveys to make sure that it was, it was safe for a, for a computer to be packed up in a box and taken down a corridor in some kind of military um, complex, you know, so his job was to come in with the forms, to fill out the forms, to find the appropriate packaging, to put the computer in a box and to carry it oh down the, the corridor when any, you know, anybody could just pick up the computer and just take it down the corridor. And that's the kind of that's the kind of job that he's talking about. But when you have a state that proliferates taxation and bureaucracy in the, in the way that we're talking about, this is what happens. You know, people's people's time is wasted, their labor is wasted, and ultimately has a kind of spirit spirit sapping quality mm. that pervades that 
that bureaucratic aspect of society. And I, I don't know, Daniel, I don't really come into contact with this very much, but I know when I receive an email from somebody who's in this kind of world, because there's a kind of, do you know what I mean? There's a sort of vibe about the whole thing. Mm. Yeah, it, there's a Kafkaesque despair that you <laughs> that, 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 that they inhabit. I mean, the extraordinary thing is, you and I know this, don't we? That the Church of England, for instance, yeah. has gone down this like every other institution. I mean, thankfully, a lot of the the efficiencies of the Church of England are not sound enough to actually have the impact that make to make our lives too mm. hellish. I think if you're in teaching or in medicine. Uh, you know, if we had the same pressures, you and I would be up to midnight every night filling in forms and paperwork uh, and uh, and having to give sermon plans, upload them uh, to you imagine? sermon you imagine? plan efficiency office. <laughs> yeah, there, efficiency there might be some, there might be some conversions, you. Daniel. There might be some conversions at the, the administrative level. Yeah, but but there are, you know, the last 50 years, the ballpark figure is that there are now there are now six thousand desk jobs mm. in the Church of England, paid desk jobs at diocesan uh, and uh, national level, not yeah. parochial level, but national level. Uh, and um, fifty years ago, there were four hundred. Yep, there you go. Uh, and the number of clergy is reduced by about five six thousand yeah. so you know we, we have the you know creation justice enablers and <laughs> uh, and so on so on don't we, we, yeah. we uh, it, it, you know, the church times there are, there are parts of the job pages which which look almost identical to the guardian saturday supplements where th these sort of non-jobs uh you know archdeacon of outer space with you know, with, with special reference to, I don't know, the moon, but you know, it's, it, it's kind of laughable, isn't it? You, you see, in fact, Archdeacon of Outer Space might be useful. I'd apply for that. But um, that's fun. Uh, and and these jobs become self-justifying, don't they? And they're never actually quite laser in on doing anything particularly specific. Yeah. You know, the, the creation justice enabler is more about policy and in and then auditing clergy are they doing x y and z mm. so you end up with these feedback loops yeah. where you're filling in paper to make them look busy yeah 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 at usually 50k yeah absolutely we need a we need a new Francis of Assisi to come along Daniel and to challenge us to to bring us back to the radical ways of Jesus and uh, to chase all the bureaucrats out of the uh, centralised Church of England. Hey, but listen, um, I I um, am running out of time here, so we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to move it along um, and do a question of the Rev, if that's all right, Daniel. Mm. And then, uh, so basically, what we'll do is we'll do a question of the Rev, and then I will play out the entirety of the interview with Richard. So so stay tuned for that because that's a really good interview, and you're really going to enjoy it. He really uh, lets loose in that one. Uh, but before we go any further. Let me just say that if you have enjoyed this podcast, please do consider supporting us here at Irreverence. Um, we have overheads for this podcast. It costs us money to make this. And I don't have a stipend and I live off the money that this podcast makes and a couple of other things that that I do as well. So please, uh, you are actually supporting me specifically and this podcast if you do support us. So uh, please consider uh, becoming a Patreon today. And the way that you can do that is to go to irreverendpod.com click the big red button and you can become a patreon for as little as one pound 50 plus VAT in the uk unfortunately it's a bit of a drag but uh, that's the way it is uh per month and if you become a patron at any level you get our special bonus podcast which is called uncollared we have chats and banter i have quite a few arguments with tom on that that some people find quite amusing and you get that any single level and um we also release the the episodes early as well so please do consider supporting us if you don't feel that you can support us monthly at this time uh, do buy us a coffee uh, buymeacoffee.com forward slash reverend you can also find that on reverend pod it's not a literal coffee it's a virtual coffee uh, but it's just a way of making a donation via the website so please we really on, do was it was it on signal last week he decided that 
the Virgin Mary didn't have grandparents. <laughs> no, his parents. His parents. And we did have a big argument about this. Now, the parents, he, that was he, it. Yeah. yeah, he kept on calling them fictional. And I was trying to make the point that if they're fictional, it would mean that the Virgin Mary didn't exist. I think he was baiting you. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I think what he actually meant is that we don't know what their names are or any of the information about their lives you know, according to his view of things. But we had we had a big argument about that. And I totally owned him. So um, if, if people want to hear that, they can um, either listen to it on Patreon if they're already there or become a patron and uh, go back and listen to it. Um, but we do that every week, uh, more or less. And it's quite a lot of fun. Uh, or it can be serious. We've done some serious ones as well. Uh, but it's just like a little extra. Um, you often talk about stuff that we don't normally cover on the podcast. So please do go there, brevinpod.com. And click on the big red button to support us on Patreon. Really, really appreciate that. Now, Daniel, here we go. It's time for this. Mm. Credit to uh, Vaughan, as always, for his wonderful Question the Red theme tune, which we really appreciate. We had the string quartet at our last live event playing this. Uh, which was, it was awesome. fantastic it was great wasn't it yeah fantastic uh anyway it's time for question the rev and we've got a question of rev here we'll miss out a bit of this because i don't want to identify this person i don't want to out this person uh i'm writing because i want to ask for your advice please my son's school has put on his year six equipment list a bible and note that quote we use the new revised standard version anglicized anglicanized version uh and then they have a given an iasbn number very specific <laughs> I believe in you You and Tom both rate the RSV highly. I'm used to the ESV, uh, another word-for-word word translation, but I believe the NRSV has chosen gender-neutral language, and this version contains the Apocrypha. As a parent, would you go for the same version other children will have but teach your children why gendered language matters, or get the one that translates gendered words correctly? I realise this is a big question for the theology teacher too, as this is a question about why they're needing the Apocrypha, but wanted to ask what you do. So, Daniel, if I could just say a word about mm. the actual translation, just to clarify a couple of issues here so that people can understand what's what's going on. So um, there's a difference between uh, word-for-word translations and sort of thought-for-thought translations. So thought-for-thought translations uh, translate the scriptures uh, more generally, not, not looking at translating every single word um, and then and then make trying to make it as coherent as possible. Word for word translations tra- try and translate every word as far as possible and to turn it into coherent English. Now, to give an example of that um, and why it's difficult in the Greek language, uh, the language is more heavily inflected. So it's less about word order and more about the the endings and the beginnings of words, broadly mm-hmm. speaking. Uh, so if you if you were to try and translate it word for word into English, it would to make total it would be total nonsense because uh, all the words would be in the wrong place our language depends uh, largely upon where words are in sentences to make sense so you can't do it exactly word for word you have to kind of shift them all around and make the put them in the right place and sometimes add little words in but anyway um translations like the rsb the esb the king james bible and to a certain extent the nrsb are word for word translations now the NRSV is the new revised standard version, which is an updated version of the RSV, which is the revised standard version. The revised standard version is a highly kosher, word-for-word English translation of the Bible. The NRSV is not. And the reason that it's not is because it has chosen to put a an ideological philosophy of translation above what translation, in my view, should actually be doing, which is about translating the actual words on the page. So where the original languages might use a word like um, anthropos or anthropoi, which means men, the NRSB will invariably translate that in gender neutral terms such as person and sometimes rather obscurely using words like mortals and other strange words like that. Uh, Similarly, where the Apostle Paul addresses a church using a a term like Adelphoi, which means brothers, the NRSB will put brothers and sisters. Um, Now, as I say, these are ideological decisions. Regardless of what you think about the patriarchal or or sexist language of scripture um nevertheless those are the words that are used and in my view that's the job of the translator is to translate the text as it was written not to impose some kind of 21st century ideological construction upon the text so in my view it is a problem it's a theological problem as well because it totally obscures the meaning of certain texts and it also obscures the original context um, Psalm 8, for example, is a particular favorite of mine. What is man that you're mindful of him? Quoted in the book of Hebrews to refer to Christ. 
uh, NRSB, what are mortals that you're mindful of them completely obscures the, the Christological reference. Uh, Revelation 21, behold, the dwelling of God, mm. the dwelling place of God is now and, with and, men, is translated, behold, the dwelling place of God is now with mortals, even though we're talking about the new heavens and the new mm. earth where nobody's mortal anymore. Exactly, yeah. So it says, yeah. Uh, there's exactly. a similar problem, isn't there, in um, with the translation of the Gospel of John, yeah. where um, sons of God is translated into children. Yes. And, and of course, what sonship here is is clearly mirroring the sonship of Christ, the, the the idea of the oldest son being the heir. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it, it infantilizes Christian discipleship and our unity, our communion with God into being, you know, we're called to be children rather than sons. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and so, so you, you end up with this lacklustre, presentation yeah. and he, it takes the uh, edge it takes the, it edge, takes the edge off it doesn't it really yeah. uh, it's um, the same thing with the adelphoi thing as well because mm. you look at that and you say well adelphoi means brothers therefore it's patriarchal and sexist etc etc but the fact is is that when the apostle paul used use the word adelphoi he's addressing a mixed congregation so there's actually you might think well actually there's something interesting there isn't it because he's not just addressing the men as brothers but he's addressing the women as brothers as well so he's actually saying that these people all have the same kind of status. They've all got the status of brothers. They've all got the status of men, which is actually re- in a in a patriarchal culture, which it was, you know, and and not. And I don't mean that in a good way either. I mean that it was a it was a culture in which women were not valued in the same way as men. Uh, the women were being raised up to a higher level. And so, if you translate that brothers and sisters, it totally obscures any sort of edge or interest that that that, that might have. So uh, it, uh, it, it's like when you go to these conferences and you get. Yes, you know, some clever so and so says, "Oh, you know, welcome sisters and brothers." And I always think, oh, "Really? Did you need that's to say a, that?" That's you a know, tell. It, that's a tell. It's so it's so virtue signalling. It's horrible. Uh, I mean, surely, surely, most people can understand this, just like with the Lord's Prayer, that it's our Father for a reason, and it doesn't mean that you know God the Father is a male in the sky with a beard. And I think anybody with intelligence can figure the, figure this out, that when we talk about the brotherhood of man, uh, which was a, you know, I grew up in the 70s. and Great band. Brotherhood of man, you know. It, 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 well, didn't, well, that was, it wasn't an exclu- it, was, it wasn't a, pay, it was the last thing you could possibly yeah. think, you know, and um it's all kind of tiresome, isn't it? I mean, it's this drab, drab aesthetic of the progressives, mm. yep. which just eviscerates any joy or sparkle out of anything, you know, and just blandifies texts and mm. art and building and so on. Yeah. Um I, I agree, Daniel. We need to we need to address the practical question as well about the um you know whether what our advice would be about well just as a um, breaking news yeah um as from what i understand the nrsv is is out of print oh really there was an article two weeks ago that came out said that it there will no longer be any more prints of it i mean the, the only thing i can think that's used for is these lectionary books yeah yeah and it's used in cathedrals and academics it's using cathedrals i mean we've got it at our church as a the big red book it's mm. on a sunday um but aside from and we've got we've also got an rsv huge yeah, yeah. rsv that we use um sometimes when we're when it's it's it's, it's just more precise Mm. But um, yes, it's going out of print. So, you know. yeah, well, that's probably because it's not but, the Bible, Daniel. I mean, I don't want to be too extreme, but basically it's not the Bible because it's not an, it's not an accurate translation and it doesn't carry the same power as an accurate translation of scripture. I mean, I, I don't know what to um, recommend. I, I think the the issue here is, you know, what what the child will actually need this Bible for. And and whether he'll be at a practical disadvantage, I suppose, not having it. But I, my sort of general advice is you want to put the the actual words of scripture in your children's hands as, as much as possible. And I really think that the NRSV is 
um, is not is not an accurate translation of scripture. And so I think you've got to actually you've got to actually think about it in that way that this is not a faithful translation of scripture and this is foisting an ideology upon people uh, which is reflective of the spirit of the age rather than the spirit of christ um i think the apocrypha so in in um uh, the church of england you know the 39 articles would say that the apocrypha is is um not inspired in the same way as the other books of scripture but nevertheless it, it is edifying uh for for reading and meditation and so on so i don't think there's any reason to be worried about the apocrypha being in, included in a bible uh and i think th- it's clearly um, theologically and historically significant as well so um it, it is helpful to ha- to have it would have access to it as it's, far as quite fun, it's quite fun to hear um, maccabees being read oh, yeah the book <laughs> of you've been in a cathedral great. and heard maccabees read in all its gory details yeah, yeah uh, and the uh, clergy person uh, cl- clearly so uncomfortable with the uh, graphic descriptions of um, persecution yeah absolutely the Mac- book of Maccabees is great great uh or the two books they're, they're great books um there's no as far as i know the esv doesn't have a carrier translation of the apocrypha but the rsv does the rsv though i think is I don't know where the I think the RSV is it's out print as well. So you need to get your um your second hand edition. Um, but there's yeah, I think it's I think it's a valuable thing to have, provided one understands the distinction between the inspired books of scripture and and the books which are which are edifying but not inspired by by the Holy Spirit in the same way. If if they really want to wind up the teacher, get a Greek interlinear mm. and um, learn learn the basics of Greek and just keep yep. shouting out, sir. What what does mm-hmm. anthropos mean here? Yeah. Why have they translated anthropos as mortal? It doesn't have Sir. nearly the same connotation. <laughs> it's a completely different word. Um, anyway, Daniel, with that, I'm going to have to go in a minute. I hope that's helpful. Mm. Um, but uh, we wish you all the best with the decision. You could get two versions, I suppose, and you could just have two versions. Have the uh, ESV and your um, your uh, her- your heretical NRSV next to each other, and then you can see having interlinear is actually you know it's a pretty good idea really if you don't have access to the the original languages anyway um daniel let's do a prayer or something do you want to do a blessing or something before we mm. we head over to richard fothergill i think so let's do the um, eighth sunday of trinity collect mm. let us pray oh god whose never failing providence ordereth all things both in heaven and on earth we humbly beseech thee to put away from us all hurtful things and to give us those things which are profitable for us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, Daniel, thank you as always. And thanks to all our listeners. And we really hope you enjoy the episode or the interview, I should say, with Richard Fothergill. I'll see you again next week. Okay, well, now we are joined by the Reverend Richard Fothergill, who is a priest in the Carlisle Diocese and the most recent ecclesiastical victim of the debanking phenomenon that we've been uh, talking about a bit on this show. Uh, So it's great joy and um, privilege to be joined by you, Richard. Richard, thank you very much for giving up some of your time to the podcast today. My pleasure. No, really good to be able to chat. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Richard, you're on you're on holiday at the moment, so that's a that's a double thank you from our end that you're giving up some of your time to to spend with us. Do you want to tell listeners a little bit about yourself? You know, a bit about your background. Yes, certainly. Um, I was ordained in in London in 1995, and I did my curacy in uh, St Stephen's Twickenham in southwest London which is great because one of the church wardens had some dementia seats in Twickenham. So we used to see quite a lot of matches, which was great fun. Nice. Uh, then I went off to South Africa and I was rector of a church, a new church plant, actually, in the Diocese of Cape Town, in Cape Town, mm-hmm. in the southern suburbs. And the, the bishops all redrew the map and we bought a warehouse and we started a whole new Anglican church uh, called Church of the Holy Spirit. And that's going great guns still. In fact, they've just just completed a, a brand new major building project down there. And that church is in very good heart. Mm-hmm. So we had a, a good time down there in Cape Town for seven years with my wife and two children. And then we came back and then I did two years in Bristol Diocese with a new network church called Crossnet. 
uh, with a friend of mine who's also ordained, a chap called Nick Crawley. And uh, we launched that and it became a sort of student church. We hadn't really expected that, but there were lots of students knocking around Bristol. They also had to come to this new thing we were doing. And uh, we saw quite a few of them come to faith. And that was quite exciting. And Crossnet is still going. Actually, I think I've got a branch in London now as well. So two of them. Mm. But they're Anglican. And then um, after that, I was uh, I had Bishop's license for a rural parish in Somerset, Pease Down St. John for seven years. But it was during that time that really everything started to take off with the ministry I'm currently involved with, which is a thing called the Filling Station which is a, a group of about 78 now, I think we are 78, meetings across the country. Uh, it's primarily a rural ministry. It's non-denominational. Uh, it really is meeting in village halls once a month for celebrations. And we do teaching and food and worship and prayer and testimony. And uh, about 4,000 people go to a filling station somewhere each month mm. now. Um, we've seen a lot of life come through those, actually. Mm. And they've been mm. some of them have been a really good feeder into the local churches actually because people who have come to the filling station first and they may have been very discouraged christians or not at all and uh, the lord's really met them and then they want to have more consistent fellowship so they can go and get involved with the local parishes or wherever mm. um, so that's what i'm doing now i'm involved i've got a whole bunch of friends now helping me with this because it's getting bigger and bigger uh, it's called the filling station so that's what i'm doing now wow i've heard of the filling station richard that's um oh, okay yeah, yeah, I've had people. I've had people. I'm sure I've had people email the the show mentioning the filling station. So, I mean, oh, can, yes, you tell, okay. can you tell us a little bit about more about it? Like, what? what yeah, the, well, it, it came. It came about. Really, it started in uh, end of 2003. I'd just been uh, agreed to go to Bristol to go and work for the then Bishop of Bristol, a guy called Mike Hill, a very good bishop. And um, I, I, I was with a friend. We stayed. I stayed in uh, Salford. I went with a friend, Christian friend, up for a walk after we'd had this meeting with the bishop. And that was all agreed. New church, you know. We went for a walk up a hill called Kelston Round Hill, and the top of this hill is a beautiful sunny day. And I sort of had this vision. It's the nearest thing I've ever had to a kind of an a, a open-eyed vision. It wasn't an open-eyed vision, like I'm looking at you, but in the spirit, it was very clear that the Lord was speaking to me. And I had this vision of the landscape covered in this sort of black mist and the sun was shining above it. But the black mist was the deception that Satan put over the country. You know, St. Paul talks about that. He says that the evil one has blinded the eyes and deafened the ears of those to see the marvelous riches we have in Christ Jesus, you know. And I saw this black mist covering the landscape and the people underneath didn't know God was around. And then I saw like a whirlwind uh, breaking out the mist and a shaft of light went through it and wherever it hit the ground in that area all the people underneath that shaft of light represented God's touching them really God touching them all the people underneath they sort of woke up spiritually and they started thinking oh yeah church God prayer I remember you know and they sort of came alive spiritually and I saw one little whirlwind and another one and another one the whole and the whole landscape was ultimately covered with these little whirlwinds and the black muck was pushed to one side and then by the end of it i could see that the people were able to respond to the lord and it's like spiritual sort of changing of the airwaves really above britain and um, and so i had this this extraordinary picture and i, I didn't know how quite what to make of it i mean i, I was very impactful in fact i actually took a photograph off the hill and i framed it to put it in my study to remind me and nick actually gave him one too of what we were doing but it was actually what it was, these little whirlwinds. Within two years, I knew what it was. Within two years, I met the first group who'd done one of these filling station meetings. It wasn't called that then. It was a meeting in Box Village in Wiltshire. And it was just called, it was called some Christian thing, prayer and praise or something. Anyway, they met. They been This little group had come off an alpha course. There's 13 of them off the alpha course. And they'd made some friends. And they'd just got together once a month to do a little kind of simple meeting and really copying the few things they'd learned on Alpha. So they had food, they had worship, they had teaching, they had prayer. They didn't quite understand the prayer ministry side, but they did tried it. And this group had got to about 40. And they asked me if I'd be willing to kind of join in with them and help them with it. And I felt, again, I felt the Lord saying, yes, do it. Get involved with these guys. And so that was the very first thing. We renamed it. That was the first thing we did in 2006. We renamed it the Filling Station. The Lord said that we should, we did some praying and fasting to find out what he wants to do with it. And he said, be more outward looking and rename it as the filling station. It's a place essentially where you can have a spiritual top up for the next stage of your journey. 
you know, so we're not the church in this sort of gathered sense. We're not we're not trying to do sacraments and have paid pastors and home groups and children's church, all that kind of stuff. We don't do everything that a healthy church community will do. Um, but what we do do, we do focus and we do try to do it well. And what we found the Lord uses it for is to bring discouraged Christians who have fallen out of fellowship, may not have been at church for 10 years, you know, this kind of thing. And there's always a percentage who are not Christians who are inquiring, are curious about spiritual things. And they we've seen over 600 people become Christians through the filling station over the years. Mm. Um, and then there's also another lot of Christians who are basically they're quite mature in their faith and understanding. But they're in an area, particularly a rural area, where really the church has deserted them. It's not the other way around. And so they're desperate. They're desperate for some decent teaching. They're desperate for a place where others think like they do and have the faith they do this kind of thing so we find these these things pop up and they all just pop up like mushrooms you know we do, we don't do any advertising we don't push it we're just there now to try and assist any group that wants to start, excuse me that wants to start one and to to say look well this works this doesn't work you need to talk to the local church and get linked in with them these kind of things <coughs> oh sorry don't know what i've been eating it's okay. <laughs> Choking on show is never a good way to go, is it? So, That's okay. Don't um, Just to ask uh, Richard so, for, those, so, yeah. for, um, uh, for those who are curious as to what you just said and, and think, well, I might, this, this exactly uh, fits my needs. Where yeah. might they find a filling station? I've got one about 10 miles away from, yeah. from where I'm at at Salkham at South Hams, but how yes. might people find one? Uh, and get to it well then. yeah we've got a website obviously like everybody and there's a, a map on there and there's a by county they're listed nearly every county in england's got one and uh, we've got nine in scotland uh three or four in wales one in northern ireland and we've got 12 abroad now and um, so we go to the website which is um the fillingstation.org.uk go and look at that and then you'll see by county it'll say where's my nearest meeting and then you can drop down menu you can find where you live and they'll, they'll point you in that direction. Yeah. But we have found it's a rural ministry. We've got one in central mm. London, but it is primarily a rural ministry. And I can see why, because a lot of the people that start the meeting or host the meeting and then say the people who come, a lot of them are just desperate for Christian input mm. and you know, authentic Jesus-centered teaching. You know, they, mm. they, want, they know what it is and they're not getting it. Mm. And um, it's not meant to be a sort of... Um, competition to the local church but if the local church has essentially become a bit apostate or or it's given up you know they only have one service a month or whatever in their village and there's christians around there i mean give me an idea uh, daniel i had a, a one bishop said to me that um he finds that every christian and he's a very rural bit of suffolk he's retired now but he said every village seems to have one or maybe two kind of committed christian families in the village and usually they find they're they're propping up the local Anglican church and they're doing everything. They're the church warden and they're doing the flower guild and they're giving all their money and this kind of stuff. Mm. And, the, and the priest, he poor chap or woman, is so spread out of 16 parishes, you know, you hardly ever see them. Mm. So they're basically pushing along an Anglican creature and they're not getting any input at all. So when they set up a filling station, those Christian families, they, that's where they receive. That's where they go to be topped up, to be just have a place where they can worship and sing, you know, have a place where they can be prayed for, prophesied over. Because we're very, we're very into the spiritual gifts. So we we don't mind doing prophecy and that sort of thing. Mm. So these meetings, that, that's a place of input. In fact, we found some meetings attract quite a lot of clergy as well. We've got one I can mention in Oxfordshire, mm. which um, one of the team pointed out to me. They said there are 27 ordained church leaders in this room at the moment, 100 <laughs> people in the room. He said, I know them because I was in the church myself locally. I know all these people and they've come from all these villages around about and they're using it as a as a well, a spiritual well for themselves. And I've had clergy say to me, oh, Richard, do you mind if I come to the filling station? And so I say, of course, you must come. You must come. You know, this isn't a competition and, and it's non-denominational as well. That's the mm. other thing. I think it allows, you know, people who are Methodist ministers or Anglican priests to, to go to it because they're sort of it's not in our stream. You know, it's not in mm. their particular church stream. Mm. So they feel a bit freer about turning up at a filling station. Mm. Have, have you had kickback on that? From Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I remember I had. The... I can imagine you would have. 
Oh, uh, yeah. In the early days, it's much, much better now. I think we've kind of broken through on credibility now. But in the early days, yes, definitely. I, I've even had archdeacons ringing up from the other side of the country, haranguing me for planting illegal Anglican churches in their area. Uh, that, that's what I was thinking. And oh um, so I've tried try to persuade them that, one, it's not Anglican, because half the people who come to this have nothing to do with the Church mm. of England. It's not Anglican, and it's not a church. We're not a full gathered church. I know what that looks like. We, we don't do all that kind of stuff. We do a certain number of things which get people's attention, and particularly on the evangelism. You know, the twin planks of this thing are renewal and evangelism. That's what we want to do. We want to bring new people to faith, new people to the Lord. That's the idea. Yeah. So, yes, I've had some kickback, but I say it's much better now, and, and a lot of the bishops have heard about it, and they've seen some good fruit out of it over the years, and so they're not uh, complaining. And if anyone complains to them in their diocese, they usually say, no, it's okay, it's not going to be a problem. Mm. So, mm. Richard, um, can I ask just a couple of things um, about this? And, and this might lead into what we were talking about. So the first thing is, I'm sure that there'll be some listeners here who are sort of unfamiliar with the language around the sort of charismatic aspect. Yeah, of sure. So I'd like you to say something about that, and specifically, you know, how you think that that's sort of relevant and important at this time. And then the second thing I, I, I wanted to to ask you a bit more about is in this initial vision, you said something like you you had this vision of, I think it was, you know, this nation or something like that, and it was sort of yeah. covered by a dark cloud. Yes. So could you say a bit more about that as well? Because that sounds, that sounds very relevant. Okay. Uh, yeah, so go to the dark cloud first. Um, yes, it, well, I, in that instant when I saw that thing, it's a few years ago now, but it's still quite sharp to me. It was basically all the deceptions that Satan has thrown at Britain. It's in people's minds about the character of God, why we're here, what life's like, who am I? All those kind of big questions that the evil one had so distracted them with materialism and ego and uh, deviant sexuality, whatever it is, to, to just keep them sort of crushed, essentially. It is a sort of oppression. And what I was seeing was God was above that. He represent, the son represented God and his goodness and his love for us. But it wasn't kind of penetrating, wasn't breaking through until these little whirlwinds. And interesting, the, whirlwind, the motivation in the whirlwind, I noticed, was, was actually it was when P Christians got together and worshipped and prayed that like that changed the spiritual atmosphere directly over that location, whether it was a street or a village or a suburb, whatever. It sort of changed the spiritual atmosphere that things started to happen amongst them, particularly both for those who were very discouraged Christians. Uh, they started to kind of wake up spiritually and, and think, oh, yeah, I do remember, you know, God is good and prayer does work. And, yeah, there was a really lovely priest I met 30 years ago, this kind of stuff. And they really there was a spiritual awakening. It was an awakening that took place. Uh, because we had to get the, the rubbish out of the way. We had to challenge the lie. And that's obviously what we as as ministers we're doing isn't it all the time we're we're challenging the the lies and presenting the truth mm. jesus is the truth you know he's the way the truth and the life he is it and that that's how we deal with the deception we say no no that's not correct this is what it looks like because jesus is it mm. and this is what he's taught us etc and um you know that's the whole mission of the church of god since the beginning is to present the truth present mm. jesus christ so going back to my black cloud mm. It was all along those sort of lines. And and I was just very gratified to see that it got bigger and bigger and the more and more whirlwinds. And again, quite early on when we opened this very first filling station in, in Wiltshire, again, we had various prophetic friends who came as a lady from Australia who had a very trustworthy um, prophetic ministry and had, had spoken prophetically before, which is really just God giving a bit of information to an individual which they couldn't know naturally about a situation or a person for their encouragement and strengthening and guidance and help. And, you know, this wonderful Australian lady who we've kept in contact with, um, she come with a friend who had been come over from Australia and she was going around sort of praying all around every county in Britain was what her job was, I think, at that stage. And she prophesied over us and she said that um, it was this, this filling station thing was bigger than just one little local meeting in Wiltshire and that God was going to blow through it like like the dandelion seeds you know blow through the head of the dandelion flower the seeds and they'll get spread around over the country and that's exactly what's happened you see we've never done any marketing we don't advertise this thing we don't push it at all we wait until people come to us and say we'd love to set up a filling station in yorkshire how does it work what are you doing what's this all about this kind of stuff and then we try and come alongside them and resource them and encourage them and and, and pray for them and so on 
and help them set up their meeting. But this is very much, it's a local thing. That's another aspect of it, Jamie, is that these filling stations are very much down your street. They're down your village, down your way. And it's bringing new life to some quite spiritually, quite dry parts of the country. Mm. We, we've found as a podcast that a, a considerable number of um, people have migrated in the last two, three years uh, from, say, you know, new atheism to Christianity and had a sort of a, an awakening, you know, often there on is. the back of, say, the lockdowns where they felt a sense that the grey cloud or black the, had got worse and that, right. uh, and that they sort of realised that, that, that evil is is more than just the absence of God, but it has sort of agency and power. And therefore, you know, I need to do something about it. And gosh, yeah. this Christianity stuff must be real. Yeah. Have you picked up anything on your radar like that? Uh, yeah, well, since lockdown, uh, we've got a number of meetings, not all by long shot, but a number of meetings are seeing real head on deliverances of people coming out of the mm. occult. Uh, I can think of one meeting in Yorkshire. Um, there's a couple on the team who go out actually every Tuesday, they've just got a gift in this area, they go out every Tuesday in, into Harrogate and wander about and they pray and talk to people and they pray for them. And um, they, they've they seen very clear prayers being answered. And, and I say the, the evil being, uh, the satanic stuff being tackled head on, so doing deliverance and delivering people of unclean spirits in the street, you know, Paul Iron stuff, like the Acts of the Apostles. Yeah. Very dramatic. But as a result... And of course, they they then all come to the police station, and that you know that's their kind of first kind of Christian experience corporately is a whole bunch of Christians mm -hmm. worshiping at a filling station, and so we we yeah we are definitely finding that. We, I've had I just gave a talk just the other day um, to a group of leaders saying, look, we've got to be more clued up on how to deal with the occult because it's something probably in our training. You know, I, I was trained in the nineteen nineties. In our training as Anglican ministers, it just didn't get it get a look in. You know, nobody ever talked about that. Demons. Oh well, no, that's a bit odd. You know, and but but because of such a growth in the stuff on the dark side, we need to be wise and understand how Jesus did it. And we need to be confident about praying for binding or deliverance or whatever it is. Mm. So yes, we've seen that going on. Yeah. So um Richard, do you think, I mean, we should talk about the debanking thing in a minute, but it's really yes. interesting hearing you talk about this. It's almost like what you're seeing is that as the institutional church has really lost touch with its its vocation and its calling, it's almost like the Lord is equipping and raising up other, other congregations, you know, creating... Um, new wineskins almost for for yeah. the manifestation of his presence in our in our culture um to to help people yes. spiritually i mean it's 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 very heartening in that sense but i as i said i've heard of the filling station but i didn't really realize it was this this kind of countrywide thing it's it's really quite mm. remarkable to hear to hear about this and particularly that it's in rural areas as well uh, yeah. where as you say they are such dry and uh, in many ways spiritually barren areas yeah, they can be. And that, that, you know, that the good side of it is we've we've also had lots of good church leaders, clergy, faithful churches like you two gentlemen, I have to say, who, when they've had a filling station pop up in their backyard have said, oh, thank goodness, this is new resources coming to this neck of the woods to help me and help us preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm. You know, that is it's a threat. Thank goodness. You know, we're working, we're building the kingdom of God, aren't we? We're not, mm. not building our own little empires. Yeah. And that, so in that regard, we're really thrilled and pleased that we can help the, the established local churches where they are healthy, get them even healthier and they'll add numbers to them. Mm. You know, it's, I see, I, I, I see what God's doing across the country is what he's always said he would do about being in the vine. He's pruning. Mm. So the bits of the Church of England, um, our denomination, which have rather forgotten the gospel and gone off into social work or humanism, he's pruning that back. There's nobody going to go there anymore. <laughs> it's going to be empty. You know, yeah. what a surprise. But the bits like us that are preaching the authentic original gospel, mm. that Jesus is Lord and Savior and his spirit is very much at work now. We're seeing growth. I'm only ever seeing growth in the police station yeah. and life, you know, and it's great to be able to tap that into the other parts of the body of Christ or, or the wider church that are also faithful. It's mm. exciting stuff. 
Well, that's great. I mean, it's great to hear that, Richard. Really, really good. And I'm so glad that this uh, this debanking debacle <laughs> has, has brought you brought you our way because I hope that we can continue yeah. to stay in touch and and see what the mm. Lord is doing through all of yeah. this. But talk to us, talk to us then about the debanking thing. What? what oh, what, the debanking. Well, it's a new week. word. It's new word gone. I think it's the, probably this year, year's word for the English lexicon, isn't it? Really, <laughs> debanking. Um, I basically, I've been a customer of the Yorkshire Building Society for 17 years and I'm part Yorkshire and my parents had many Yorkshire Building Society accounts over the years. I think it might have had a mortgage off, off one of them once. But anyway, so Yorkshire's always been around for us as a family and they're a perfectly good bank. And that's what I really would have to say up front. I, I, as far as banking and managing money is concerned, they're doing a really good job. Um, but that was part of my reason for writing to them was to say, well, look, guys, just concentrate on the money. You're a bank. You don't need to promote a particular social cause, or particularly one as divisive as LGBTQ Pride Month, which is obviously what's happening in June. So what happened I, every month, they send members like me uh, a run around email saying, um, this is what's going on at Yorkshire. We want to hear from you. We want to hear from our members. And the common phrase they often write is, um, how are we doing as a bank? How are we doing? So in the end of May, I, they were busy. I could see they were winding themselves up to push pride. And I, so I wrote to them just on their portal, just a simple two paragraph thing saying, one, uh, I'm not sure this pride thing is such a good idea. Why don't you just concentrate on banking or money, managing money? And then second point, I said, as a minister in the church, I have strong ethical problems with some aspects of transsexualism, particularly where transsexuals are trying to get access to our children. And I cited all the um, drag queen story hour stuff. I don't know if you're familiar with that story. Are you familiar mm. with that at all? Yeah, for sure. Uh, drag queen story hour. It's you know, it's a nasty import from America where basically drag queens, men dressed up in women's clothes, go into schools and libraries and try to sexualize sort of eight, nine, 10, 11 year old kids uh, by reading them stories and sort of persuading them any kind of sexuality, sexuality, including changing your gender is a great idea. And they're usually obviously abetted and aided by woke teachers in those places. But anyway, the first one popped up in Britain, I think in uh, November last year in Reading, they did the first one. And there was a near riot because all the parents got up and placarded it. And were very, not surprisingly, were pretty upset. They didn't want their children being interfered with by these people. And uh, the police had to be called and they had to escort the drag queens out the back door and this kind of stuff. Anyway, so I cited in my message to Yorkshire I said something as controversial as this, and I gave the link, I think, from The Guardian or somewhere, of the news coverage of it. And I thought, and I set it off, and I thought that almost certainly they're going to ignore me, because that's usually what marketing departments do with these kind of things. But I thought if a 100 other people like me write to Yorkshire and say, um, look, don't do pride, it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't help, it's divisive, you know, it's not a very good sexual ethic, you shouldn't push it. If they put some, gave some feedback along those lines, I thought maybe in 2024, Yorkshire would be sensible enough and they'd say, well, we're not going to bother with that anymore. We're not going to push that quite so heavily because it's obviously only pandering to a certain minority of Stonewall activists that the reason they're doing it. Anyway, so I thought not, that would be the best result. But of course, nothing happened for two weeks. And then I got a letter back for them, a very sharp letter um, saying, um, basically, we're offended by your comments. And they use rather pompous phrases like, your comments will not stand. <laughs> Which I can just imagine someone in the House of Commons saying in about 1890, can't you? <laughs> Sir, your comments will not stand. You can just imagine that, can't you? <laughs> and then uh, they said things like, we must protect our workforce from discrimination. Uh, I, meaning me, I think. Because yeah. uh, my <laughs> words so... Uh, you uh, evil uh, vicar. <laughs> and, and they say, we're going to close your account in two weeks' time. End of story. Wow. So take your money out or we'll close it and send you the check, Maybe. which is what they did. Goodness. Anyway, so it seemed a bit harsh, uh, <laughs> I thought. It's only a savings account. Now, bear that in mind. If it had been my current account, I'd have been absolutely stuck because two weeks' notice is too short to open a new one. Mm. And they actually broke the law in two ways because they, in their letter to me, they, they didn't specify my crime. They, should, they needed to specify in detail what it was I'd said or done wrong in there, mm. if anything. And they secondly, they only gave me two weeks. They should have, by law, given me 60 days. Mm. And it's interesting because I've shown several legal people my original message and their response. And they've all said, hands down, you could sue these guys handsomely. 
I'm mm. not going to, don't think I'm going to do that, but they, they say this is, you know, they've certainly overstepped the mark. They've just overreacted. They just don't, they kind of get rid of you as a customer um, because you don't fit the stone wall prior sort of uh, grid really. And um, uh, so anyway, so then I went to talk to my friends at uh, free speech union who are excellent and I sent them both bits of correspondence to have a look at. And I said, look, I'm on, I'm on my own strong ground here. Have I done something wrong I don't know about in my letter? Even though they were asking for it. Remember this. They asked for the comment. They asked for a view. They got a view. It just it was a wrong view. <laughs> so, And they said, no, no, completely fine. The worst could be said. You know, you were a bit, maybe a bit sharp in one sentence. But, you know, people obviously have opinions. And many of the members in the Yorkshire Building Society will have very similar opinions to you on this one. <laughs> So, so they said, uh, look, here's uh, talk to our friend. He's a journalist at the Times, James Beale. That's how the story got going. So I went and talked to him. He wrote it up quite accurately, actually. And the next thing I know, everybody else is copying it because I think the timing of it was such with the whole Nigel Farage thing mm. and their various other payments. There was on the day, it was July 4th, Saturday. There was a, a big article set in the Times all about an individual being paid £100,000 by to a barrister, I think, who'd been paid £100,000 in compensation by her chambers because they essentially hounded her out because she had gender critical views, which were not allowable anymore in that chambers. You know, and she won a big court case that same day. So there was a whole bunch of stories came together to put the spotlight on what are the banks doing? Why are they behaving in such a censorious way? And isn't it clear that really Stonewall has got to these people? And uh, this is not the way to go. Mm. So there we are. Mm. I, I retweeted the um, story uh, last week, and it was one of my biggest viewed stories I think this year. You know, essentially with a line right. along the, it, uh, this doesn't just happen to Nigel Farage; it can happen to a vicar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm, well, I'm nobody, you know, <laughs> quite right. Uh, and the next thing I know, you know, it got fifty thousand views. Yeah, interesting. Gosh, well, that's pretty uh, well. So, so it, it must, it must really. I think you know. I think what Farage has picked up and you've picked up, isn't it, that there's probably quite a lot of people out there who quietly had something like this happen to them in yeah. one way or another. Yes. Uh, right. And uh, this, th these um, two stories have become lightning rods. For... Mm. They have. They have. And I've had so much correspondence from people who say, yeah, I've done the same thing. I've also had quite a lot of people saying to well, I'm simply uh, fed up with them. I'm going to close my Yorkshire Building Society account, this kind of stuff, which, you know, it's their choice to do mm. that. I'm not, I'm not on a campaign against Yorkshire. As I say, they're a good bank, but, you know, that's their call if they want to do that. And and actually that may put some pressure on the CEO. And I, I looked into Yorkshire a little bit and their, their CEO, uh, the way she describes herself, it's very clear. She's super woke, mm. you know, really thinking her primary mission in life is to promote the LGBT agenda rather than banking. And you see, and that's the thing. They need to focus on what they're there for. And I'm glad to see the government's taken some steps. In fact, actually, I ended up talking last week to, or two weeks ago to the, the government minister, Andrew Griffiths, about this. He rang me up to ask about my little experience. And obviously, the government are going to make sure that the banks go back to what they're doing. And they may lose their banking licenses if they behave in this censorious way. Mm. I mean, Have you had any um, response back? Since all no, that's this. the other thing. They obviously the PR department at Yorkshire have decided the best thing just to keep the head down and let hopefully let the whole story disappear. Although when even with the first journalist James Beale, when he talked to them, because he talked to me and then he talked to them, mm -hmm. their comment was, "Oh, we don't do this sort of thing lightly. We don't close members' accounts lightly. Only in cases of rudeness, aggression, violence, or discrimination." Hmm. And the implication being that Richard Fothergill had been secretly one of those four things, but hmm. we Yorkshire are not telling you about it. Hmm. And so as somebody said, that's actually implied libel just in the very fact the way he put it out like that. Oh, yeah. But they're saying they haven't talked to me. The next thing I know is two weeks later, I get a very simple note with, with the check behind it for the little bit of money I had in there. Hmm. Um, so no, they don't, they don't want to talk to me. So. Richard, do you think that this is a sort of, I mean, notwithstanding the government response, which, you know, who knows whether that will come to anything or what it will yes. come to, but do you, do you think that this is a sort of a harbinger of a soft form of persecution that Christians and others are going to be looking at going forward? Just the you know, difficulties around having bank accounts and, and things of this sort. Have, have you had any thoughts about that? Yes, no, I think it's absolutely likely, absolutely likely, particularly it'll come from the uh, sexually promiscuous LGBTQ end of things. 
uh, because they are very intolerant of anybody having a an alternative sexual ethic to theirs, which is going to be a problem for them, I might say, because obviously all Orthodox Christianity has a different sexual ethic to theirs. All, all Muslims have a different sexual ethic, all Sikhs, all Orthodox Jews, even I understand traditional um, Buddhists, as in the Dalai Lama, they, they don't advocate for homosexual activity in the same way uh, Stonewall do. So, you know, they're really pushing up against the majority with their particular campaigns and aggression. And I see, I, I was interesting, I've had some correspondence from gay men, secular gay men, who, um, who said, Richard, I stand 100% behind you. I'm as disgusted as you are by the transsexual queer agenda. And one of them actually said, we didn't fight for 30 years or whatever for gay rights in order to have the whole thing scuppered by transsexuals getting in on the act, which is primarily men dressing up as women, you know, pretending they're women. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an ideology, not a not a kind of uh, uh, an inclination from birth, in, as in some cases with with obviously with homosexuality. But they I'm fascinated by that, that the. the it's not just us Orthodox Christians that are having issue with this, even within their own secular ranks. There are many. I understand there's a thing called uh, the Lay, uh, Gay and Lesbian Alliance, which was set mm. up by some ex-Stonewall people yeah. who want who don't like the transsexual agenda. Yeah. And I, I mean, I understand why. Yeah, I think it's called the LGB Alliance, isn't it? Is it okay? Oh, yeah, that may, yeah, that's right. But yes, I think it is. It is definitely first. I thought for quite a long time actually that, that it's likely in Britain that the church, we we Christians, will be persecuted from that angle, from that direction. Mm. Ever since, really, when I, I remember hearing, it must have been about 12, 13 years ago now, the Bishop of Chester, Michael Bourne, was arrested. Well, he was cautioned by the police because he'd gone on a BBC Radio Chester program. And he talked about Christian ethics and care and all sorts of pastoral issues. And he said that I think he I think he actually said that some homosexuals would do well to have some counseling. I think I think it was about as extravagant as that, you know, and there's some gay activist, Stonewall activist heard him and said it was hate speech. And of course, the police jumped up and down. And they went round to his house and on his doorstep cautioned him for hate speech and as a potential crime might have committed. Now, that was the Bishop of Chester just expressing one aspect of Christian love and Christian care. But, of course, an extremist LGBT activist didn't want to hear that. Mm. So I, when I heard that story, because uh, I, know, I know his son a little bit from ages ago, I thought, well, no, this this is likely this is going to grow. These these agitators are going to grow and they're going to be very media savvy and they're going to have a go at us. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they're going to become CEOs of yeah. big corporations. And, and that's what we've seen. It, it makes you wonder if, you know, if you're an Orthodox Christian um, or you're moral conservative yeah. uh, and you, you know, you're, you're, say you want to open up a, a, a cricket club account. <laughs> Yeah, uh, is it going to be the case now that their banks are going to be proactively looking out for people who they think are you know against the woke narrative and say, yeah. well, you know, I mean, if if I go to open a bank account now, um, say a business account or a club account, am I going to get someone who said, well, I've looked through your tweets, yeah, 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 and you know X, Y, and Z don't align with our values <sighs> yeah well that's right but you see the, I, this is where the government really does need to act and actually if enough of us kick up a stink it won't happen i believe I, i'm very i'm op generally optimistic actually we can push back against this because obviously britain we believe in free speech we believe in freedom of action freedom of association freedom of religion and this is creeping in from it's from the six sexual ethics end it's creeping in on us to try and reduce all our freedoms and turn us into the sort of um, degenerate culture that was under communism in the Cold War. This is what they used to do in the, in the Cold War. You know, the Marxists used to say, basically, unless you totally sign up to our kind of worldview, you, you're not allowed to place a university and you obviously can't run a company, this kind of stuff. You know, the state had an oppressive dictate as to how you should think and behave and what values you should have. But so enough of us kick up a fuss, fuss and sort of show, remind the banks that, no, it's not for them to set our values and dictate terms as to who 
how we how their customers should behave and think and operate and what they should do so you're right that that'll that would be the kind of worst case scenario is that anybody who's got a more traditional or conservative viewpoint on anything really falls foul of the new agenda and they they prevent you from banking and this is where i for talking to the government's minister as i said i was quite encouraged by that because they totally get the fact that banks now are like utilities you know it's like having the water cut off or your electricity cut off they mustn't be allowed to do that. They must not be allowed to have that discretionary power just to do it because there's something a customer has said and done, which, as you say, doesn't agree with our values. Yeah, the mm-hmm. values they've been fed by Stonewall. You know. yeah. and, and as implausible as it as it seems, you know that that has happened on steroids in places like Canada with the uh, trucking yeah, protests, right. where yeah, you know we, we've had uh, Canadian Anglicans reach out to us. In fact, they came down to Salkham, a few of them, and. Uh, had a holiday here and related this horrific story oh, of yeah. um, you know, the, the cancel culture where the government encouraged banks to close down accounts of um, people who were in the protest, which is a, you know an extraordinary thing. Well, it is, and but Trudeau is a, a not a good chap in that regard. He's very uh, censorious. I mean, I remember, remember making some very positive statements about the Chinese Communist Party. You know. Mm. He's, yeah. uh, that's a, I understand that's a problem in Canada, yeah. further down the line on that. But again, I believe in, even in Canada, if enough of us kick up a fuss and push back, actually, the, you know, we are democracies. We do mm. have leverage here. You know. I, I think my concern would be that if we have uh, a general election next year and a, and a government comes in on a, uh, you know, a progressive agenda uh, and uh, decides to go full throttle on mm. it and, and allow the institutions to be captured in any way possible, then we could end up where, you know, you and I can't get a, yeah, an internet a account yeah, or a telephone, right. <laughs> let, yeah, let yeah, alone yeah, a bank yeah. account. And this, that is, can this be a is a real problem. problem. This is one of the reasons why it's so important that we don't allow cash to be eliminated from society mm. as well, because it just aids the process, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I agree with him. Yeah, mm. quite right. Too. Yeah, yeah, fight for cash. It's interesting. I, we, I've just been over in the early in the year. We've got some police stations in Sweden. And I was talking to some of the Swedish Christians over there because um, obviously Sweden tried a few years ago to be a totally cashless society. Mm. And they really tried, but the people wouldn't have it. So banknotes are back in. OK, yeah, they do a lot. You still do a lot by tapping your card everywhere. But the fact is that the Swedes have said, no, thanks. It's just not not feasible. Mm. We're not gonna allow that. So, we, you know, there again, these battles can be won, I think, if we push. Yeah, interesting. Well, Richard, listen, we should let you get on with your with your relaxation and your holiday time. But do you have any anything else that you'd like to say to our listeners at all about this issue or or any any word from the Lord? Uh, there doesn't have to be. Just thought I'd give you an opportunity. Well, thank you for asking. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I've been finding all through this last month with all this media kind of stirring up and activity and things, one thing I really love to do is is to kind of endorse and to your listeners. Ephesians 6, you know, where St. Paul talks about it. It's very much in the context of a spiritual battle. Mm. He says, when you've done all things, to stand. So stand then. When you've done all things, stand. And that, I think, for us, is the way to go. Mm. If I've given anybody a little bit of courage or encouragement to say, stand up to these woke bullies, stand up to this progressive agenda, which is, I believe, demonic, stand up to this progressive agenda, it comes under the guise of being kind and inclusive and nice, but actually it isn't. It's totalitarian. It'll remove your rights and it'll it'll turn you into an unperson because you're not agreeing with them. But we can stand up. If we stand up now, I believe that there's great hope. And I think that's kind of almost the church's mandate. We need to stand up. And particularly in our denomination, you know, we've just this year, we've seen quite a lot of sliding away of conforming with the secular, with the mindset. And we need, we need to stand. We say, no, that's not, not Jesus Christ. That's not godly. That's not right. That's not how he revealed to us how the world works. We're going to stand on him and on his teaching. So Ephesians 6, as I say, is a kind of key scripture for me in the minute. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you, Richard, for that. I, I really appreciate that. That very much chimes with, with where we're coming from sure. as, as, as priests and Christians as well. So, and as yeah. a podcast. So thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for your time, uh, Reverend Richard Fothergill. Pleasure. Pleasure. Great pleasure to be with him. <laughs>